Good morning, you guys. My name is Shantae Holiday. I am about to work out live on my indoor bike, and I figured I would invite you to come along with me. So if you want to work out with me, you're welcome to. If you want to save this video and come back later, um, then you're welcome to do that too. But I am going to try to push out at least 15 to 20 minutes while listening to Think and Grow Rich on my laptop. So yeah, good morning and have a great day. Until 
until you succeed, no matter how much time is required. So the engineers went ahead. Six months went by. Nothing happened. Another six months passed, and still nothing. The engineers tried every conceivable plan to carry out the order, but the thing seemed out of the question. Impossible. At the end of the year, Ford again checked with his engineers, and again they told him they had found no way to carry out his orders. Go right ahead, said Ford. I want it, and I'll have it. They went ahead. And then, as if by a stroke of magic, the secret was discovered. The Ford determination had won once more. Henry Ford was a success because he understood and applied the principles of success. One of these principles is desire, knowing clearly what you want. Remember this Ford story as you continue reading this book. Pick out the lines in which the secrets of his stupendous achievement have been described. If you do this, if you can put your finger on those particular principles that made Henry Ford rich, you may equal his achievements in almost any calling for which you are suited. Editor's Comments To those readers who may interpret Ford's actions as nothing more than obstinacy, the editors would point out that he was employing a technique that has become a common part of strategic planning in many industries, including aerospace, computers, medicine, and the military. When launching large, complicated, long-term projects, the planners often know that at certain points along the way, they will need components that simply do not yet exist. The fact that at the beginning there is no way to get from A to B does not deter them. There are many parts of the project they can get started on now, and they just assume that by the time they get to the point where they will need a technology or a device, they will have solved the problem of making it. And they have been proven right time and again. Stated simply, the technique is to clearly know what you want to accomplish, have faith in your ability to do it, and persist until you have accomplished your goal. This is the end of the editor's comments. Why you are the master of your fate. When the famed English poet William Henley wrote the prophetic lines, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, he should have informed us that the reason we are the masters of our fate, the captains of our souls, is that we have the power to control our thoughts. He should have told us that it is because in some way our brains become magnetized with the dominating thoughts that we hold in our minds. And it is as though our magnetized minds attract to us the forces, the people, and the circumstances of life that are in sync with our dominating thoughts. He should have told us that before we can accumulate riches in great abundance, we must magnetize our minds with intense desire for riches. That we must become money conscious until the desire for money drives us to create definite plans for acquiring it. But being a poet, Henley contented himself by stating a great truth in poetic form, leaving those who followed him to interpret the philosophical meaning of his lines. Little by little, the truth has unfolded itself, until I have come to know with certainty that the principles described in this book hold the secret of mastery over our economic fate. Principles that can change your destiny. We are now ready to examine the first of these principles, and as we do, I ask you to maintain a spirit of open-mindedness. Remember, as you read, that these principles are not in my invention nor are they the invention of any one person. These principles have worked for literally millions of people. You, too, can put them to work for you and your own enduring benefit. You will find it easy, not hard to do. Some years ago, I delivered the commencement address at Salem College in Salem, West Virginia. I emphasized with so much intensity the need to have a burning desire that one of the members of the graduating class became completely convinced and made it a cornerstone of his own philosophy. That young man became a congressman and an important factor in President Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration. He wrote me a letter in which he so clearly stated his opinion of the principle of desire outlined in the next chapter that I have chosen to publish his letter as an introduction to that chapter. It gives you an idea 
of the rewards to come. My dear Napoleon, my service as a member of Congress having given me an insight into the problems of men and women, I am writing to offer a suggestion which may become helpful to thousands of worthy people. In 1922, you delivered the commencement address at Salem College when I was a member of the graduating class. That address you planted in my mind an idea which has been responsible for the opportunity I now have to serve the people of my state and will be responsible in a very large measure for whatever success I may have in the future. I recall, as though it were yesterday, the marvelous description you gave of the method by which Henry Ford, with but little schooling, without a dollar, with no influential friends, rose to great heights. I made up my mind then, even before you had finished your speech, that I would make a place for myself, no matter how many difficulties I had to surmount. Thousands of young people will finish their schooling this year and within the next few years. Every one of them will be seeking just such a message of practical encouragement as the one I received from you. They will want to know where to turn, what to do to get started in life. You can tell them, because you have helped to solve the problems of so many, many people. There are thousands of people in America today who would like to know how they can convert ideas into money. People who must start from scratch, without finances, and recoup their losses. If anyone can help them, you can. If you publish the book, I would like to own the first copy that comes from the press, personally autographed by you. With best wishes, believe me, cordially yours, Jennings Randolph. Since that time in 1922, I watched Jennings Randolph rise to become one of the nation's leading airline executives a great inspirational speaker and a United States Senator from West Virginia. <laughs> 35 years after I made that speech, it was my pleasure to return to Salem College in 1957 and deliver the baccalaureate sermon. At that time, I received an honorary Doctor of Literature degree from Salem College. Editor's Comments As you begin the next chapter, the editors would like to reinforce the earlier statement that what you are reading is not just a collection of theories out of which you can cherry pick what you like. The 13 principles of success were proven by the real life experiences of the long list of famous successful people cited earlier by Napoleon Hill. His techniques are also practiced and endorsed by the contemporary experts and authors whom the editors mentioned following Hill's list. More than 60 million people have purchased copies of the book that you are now holding in your hands. If this book has proven to be that successful, surely you owe it to yourself to give it every chance to work for you too. Read it. Don't question it. Do it. If you don't, if you think that you know better than Napoleon Hill, if you decide to pick and choose the parts that you will believe or follow, then, if you don't succeed, you'll never know if your failure lies with this book, or with you. This is the end of the editor's comments. Whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Chapter 3. Desire. The starting point of all achievement. The first step toward riches. When Edwin C. Barnes climbed down from the freight train in West Orange, New Jersey, he may have resembled a tramp, but his thoughts were those of a king. As he made his way from the railroad tracks to Thomas A. Edison's office, his mind was at work. He saw himself standing in Edison's presence. He heard himself asking Mr. Edison for an opportunity to carry out the one consuming obsession of his life a burning desire to become the business associate of the great inventor. Barnes' desire was not a hope. It was not a wish. It was a pulsating desire which transcended everything else. It was definite. A few years later, Edwin C. Barnes again stood before Edison in the same office where he first met the inventor. This time, his desire had been translated into reality. He was in business with Edison. The dominating dream of his life had become a reality. Barnes succeeded because he chose a definite goal. 
placed all his energy, all his willpower, all his effort. He put everything he had to achieving that goal. Five years passed before the chance he had been seeking made its appearance. To everyone except himself, he appeared to be just another cog in the Edison business wheel. But in Edwin Barnes' own mind, he was the partner of Edison every minute from the very day that he first went to work there. It is a remarkable illustration of the power of a definite desire. Barnes won his goal because he wanted to be a business associate of Mr. Edison's more than he wanted anything else. He created a plan by which to attain that purpose, and he burned all bridges behind him. He stood by his desire until it became the dominating obsession of his life. And finally, a fact. When he went to West Orange, he did not say to himself, I will try to induce Edison to give me a job of some sort. He said, I will see Edison Hi guys, good morning. and put him on notice you? that I have come to go into business with him. He did not say, I will keep my eyes open for another opportunity in case I fail to get what I want in the Edison organization. He said, there is one thing in this world that I am determined to have and that is a business association. All right. We need to do this in a minute. I'm trying not to crack too hard because my little ones don't sleep back there. But I'm going to see if I can do this in five more minutes. And, um, he left no yeah, I just, way of what I do when my flesh, my body starts giving me a hard time, I just help anyone else is either really lean forward or just lean back. And I close my eyes and I focus on the words of the book, the person who's reading. And a that's another reason why when I do choose an audio book and step there, I'll go to different versions to see which person's voice I like the most because I'm trying to focus on the person who's reading the book. Which person's voice I like the most because I'm focusing on that voice, right? Um, yeah, but my little man just woke up. I know he has a shirt on, but I think he's about to just pull up, so I'm going to end it here. And I hope you guys have an amazing morning. And hey, guys. Say hi. Trying to hide his looks. Say hi. Say good morning. Good morning. He's like, I don't talk good morning now. Oh, he got his hair done, you guys. Well, by me, so yeah. But I hope you guys have a great day. Bye. Thank you.